Welcome to the From Burnout to Recovery show with your host, Dr. Kate. This is where your journey to burnout recovery starts. Are you feeling overwhelmed or like work has become unmanageable? Join me and my guests for open and honest conversations about burnout recovery from the comfort of the front porch. I am here to help you build your resilience and prepare you for burnout in a whole new way through a variety of perspective. Move past the idea that burnout can only be addressed by avoidance and work to integrate recovery into your daily life. Relax, take a breath. The From Burnout to Recovery show starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the From Burnout to Recovery show with Dr. Kate on Transformation Talk Radio and member of the Cornelia Stephanie Media Group. I am your host, Dr. Kate, and I'm excited to welcome you to our show today. Remember, as you are enjoying the show, to hit that subscribe button, give us a review, and share this with someone else who needs to hear this message about burnout. You can also download the KS Media Group app for access to all the world's best influencers in one place. Today, we are going to be joined by our guest, Melissa Miller. She is a former certified nursing assistant from 2004 until July, 2020, when her husband began having epileptic seizures. She began her journey as a stay-at-home mom and caregiver for her husband officially in May of 2020. Melissa created her business out of her own frustration for the lack of resources for women who are thrust into making that choice to then transition home to care for their husband and children full-time. She is passionate about offering support that she never had when she began her journey and being sure that women take care of themselves from day one. Melissa, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, well, I am excited to talk to you a little bit more too. I think that this topic of, of caregivers and the burnout that is experienced as part of that is something that is so incredibly important. And I, you know, in the work that I've been doing a little bit in regard to burnout and talking with caregivers and those kinds of things, I know oftentimes that there's a, you know, a suffering and silence that occurs in that aspect. And I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit about that. So I would love to open this up with, if you would just tell us a little bit more about yourself, your experience with burnout and your journey to burnout recovery. Thank you. Uh, well, hi, I'm Melissa Miller. I'm a full-time stay-at-home mom and spousal caregiver, uh, 15 years experience as a healthcare worker, primarily in long-term care facilities. That was my passion. I really loved advocating for the uh, elderly because they're often yeah. forgotten forgotten and neglected yeah. excuse me uh and I loved it and I thought I would do that indefinitely and so having a former career in healthcare you tap into making sure that you're taking care of yourself anyway because it is spiritually emotionally mentally and physically draining on you so you're having to take, take care of yourself anyway and then plus you're still a mom and a wife and everything else in between all the things right right, <laughs> right. yeah but I would say it's a whole different game when you're actually caring for a sick spouse or even mm. a, a sick child, if, if that's your situation, if you have a disabled child, it's a whole different game. Uh, the thing that got me into trouble, I would say the most is neglecting myself. Mm. What do we do as women, as moms, we tend to put ourselves on the back burner, which is a big no-no. And I would say that's what led to me really burning out. I would say the beginning of 2021 by January, I was just having a lot more health problems than I typically do than just my baseline. Because I have some chronic things of my own that I struggle with. I struggle with hypothyroidism and I've been prone to deal with a lot of gut problems related to that in of itself. And it just got so out of control. And I put it off until about spring, I would say, April, May of 2021. And then it took me the whole rest of the year. I didn't get a diagnosis of IBS until December. <laughs> and I was having to get, and I had neglected my journaling and other little tips that have helped me with coping spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically with my self-care. And so I've had to get back on the horse. Mm -hmm. And I think it's critical that we do that as, as women and as moms. But obviously as a coach and a mentor, I want to give the same kind of love 
to myself that I tell my mom to, right? You know, you want to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, So it's been a journey and I'm still recovering, but I'm getting into a rhythm of what works for me. Even -hmm. even work, like getting back into my work schedule is a form of self-care because when I work and I can stay ahead and keep up on things, my stress level goes down. I feel like, and I feel fulfilled because my healthcare work, I felt like was a ministry. And mm-hmm. I feel like this type of work is a new ministry mm-hmm. because it's not being talked about. There's yeah. stuff for amazing stay-at-home moms, which I'm glad there's those resources. There's stuff for specific chronic incurable illnesses like epilepsy, like my husband has and other mm-hmm. things like multiple sclerosis and other things like that. But the problem that I was seeing in my journey, especially when, because we had the perfect storm. My husband gets sick December, 2019. Mm -hmm. He is health plummets April of 2020 Mm -hmm. and then really plummets in May. The pandemic hit what between January and March. So we Mm -hmm. were already shut down. So even resources that I could tap into for one or the other for for caregiving or motherhood were shut down. Yeah. And the big thing I also ran into was it wasn't anything for light for a situation for a person like me. There wasn't anything for the gap in between. And that's when I want to raise awareness with my work yeah. is that there needs to be something in between. And especially with your topic, which I'm so excited that you're talking about, because it's such a big topic and it's so taboo, self-care mm-hmm. for now, big time buzzwords, right? So it's very, very important that we raise awareness and advocate like, Hey, it is okay to take care of yourself. And if you don't take care of yourself, you are going to burn out really fast and it's going to be a hard burnout and it will take time to recover because like I said I I started plummeting in January and here we are a year later and mm-hmm. I'm still recovering so it's not it's not worth it to neglect yourself and it's it's better to be proactive in the beginning For, yeah I could not agree more about that proactiveness in the beginning although it's those of us that have experienced burnout like we don't do that because it's hard to recognize. It really does sneak up on you, I think. And I think you had said something about the fact that it sounded like you had a pretty good practice recovery practice for yourself when you were working in healthcare itself. But when you were in this new role of caregiver, that some of those things kind of went away in that transition piece. And I think that that is an interesting thing um, to highlight for our listeners, because sometimes when we transition, um, you know, in burnout or someone's going from a job or something to that effect, we, we lose track of some of those habits that we've developed. And so just highlighting that a little bit, when you kind of started recognizing where you were at, at the beginning of 2021. And you were realizing like, oh, Hey, now I'm starting to experience some burnout with this, you know, with spousal care and, and parenting and all of these things. What were some of the like first steps you took to get yourself back into that, like harmonious space? It wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but I, I say the three, three things, excuse me, that worked the most for me, we're getting back into journaling. You know, I've always kept a diary since I was a little girl. I haven't done much in my in my 20s and 30s, but man, with all the trauma, because I'm going to actually mm-hmm. use that word trauma. When you go through a transition and you burn out, there's usually some sort of trauma that has occurred, whether that's um, the shock of becoming a mom after giving birth and then just, okay, you're presented with this beautiful new life, but then you just go home to the hospital with no manual you're sleep deprived, you you have no roadmap, you know what I mean? You're totally going at it at your own, even though you might have support, which is good. You don't have a necessarily a blueprint about, Mm -hmm. oh, if I do X, Y, and Z, I will get to A, B, and C. It doesn't work that way. And so then that creates more stress and overwhelm and you have the trauma of that, especially uh, using that example, if your birth didn't go as planned, if there was Mm -hmm. complications, so there's that trauma. Same thing is true for caregiving. Yeah. Whether you're a healthcare worker dealing with a pandemic, I've had I still have friends that are still practicing as nurses and and, and certified nursing assistants uh, during the amid the pandemic. And oh my gosh, it is so heartbreaking yeah. to see how burnt out and exhausted they are from all the craziness that they're that they're dealing with right now. So there's trauma there, and then there's trauma with the situation that I've gone through, where my husband and I have this anticipated beautiful life that we're going to have mm-hmm. in terms of 
working opposite shifts, raising our daughter, uh, working opposite shifts to um, alleviate the need for paying a lot of money for childcare because hello, it is expensive, especially mm -hmm. where we live. And to have that and have all these goals and to have it just ripped out from underneath us unexpectedly with an illness that he had no prior history of mm -hmm. as a child, he had no family history of it, and he falls in this horrible 20% of the population that for no apparent reason, he is diagnosed, he's one in the 20% of the population that for no apparent reason will be diagnosed with some sort of seizure disorder. Yeah. So there's that trauma and just adjusting to our life the way it is because he can't we both can't parent the same way that we used right. to. I have to be the one that's um, the the supervised supervising adult because mm -hmm. I'm the one that needs to watch out for attacks. I'm the one that needs to give up medicine. I'm the one that has to call the doctor, argue with insurance. You, you name it, the mm -hmm. list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And and chase a toddler, I might add, yes. in between it all. Yeah. So there's sort all sorts of trauma. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it's important that trauma can come in many forms and so if you're listening and you're like oh trauma that's such a taboo cliche word it doesn't apply to me there can be other types of trauma okay and it is totally okay to need to release that whether that's writing journaling yelling screaming crying you have to release that before you can move forward and be on the road to recovery because I had to do that I had to do a lot of journaling believe me where I'd write like four or five pages where I basically was screaming words and so that I wouldn't be screaming at my family mm -hmm. or, or someone else into my notebook I had to do that um other things that have helped music or something inspirational something that can help you feel calm yeah because our brain likes to keep us safe it is just struggling and fighting and yelling at us to I can't deal with this I mm -hmm. this is an uncomfortable situation and I don't know what the heck of how to deal with this and so we have to be in control and say listen I know you're scared I'm scared. I understand that fear. I understand that trauma, but we need to step back and you have to trust me to get us through this situation. Even though it looks like there's no safe way through mm -hmm. there, we have to trick our brain into going that there is a safe way through. Yeah. I really, I appreciate that. And that aspect of releasing that trauma is so important and finding ways to do that, that work, that work for you. For some folks that, you know, it might be, you know, journaling, it may be that, you know, a counseling experience or working with a coach. And so, you know, who, where are my external processors who got to like talk it out? Right. So talking to another person, Absolutely. Um, that, that yelling, I, I let a lot of mine out in the car when I'm by myself. So I just yell at other drivers. Right. And, you know, <laughs> I just assume they can't, at least, at least they can't hear what I'm saying. They can probably figure it out by looking at my mouth if they're in that aspect. But I think that that's an important piece. The other piece with trauma that I think is really important for us to remember is that it's not comparable. No, like the trauma that I experience in my life, and we all experience trauma on some level. And when things happen, I think you talked about that with like transitions, definitely, you know, a trauma piece. And we react to them differently. They show up differently for us. And that's true for like every human being. So, you know, I like to make sure like listeners don't get into like the comparison cycle of trying to compare your trauma to someone else's or how it's manifesting for you and how it comes across for other people. I think that's incredibly important. Absolutely. There's no, well, and here's the thing. I would also be careful with the trap of comparing traumas you may have already experienced trauma, like, mm. well, I got through that one and I should be tougher. And, you know, yeah, I've experienced because it could be different. Yeah. Exactly. I think I personally, just to kind of piggyback off what I, what I know from my own journey is I experienced trauma of racism as a little girl for being Asian. I was the only Asian kid first through fourth grade in a predominantly black and Asian black and Hispanic school. Mm -hmm. And it was bad. We ended up in the principal's office once because it was that bad. It was yeah. horrible. <laughs> so there's that kind of trauma. So I've had for years just struggled with how I look being comfortable in my own skin. That's always been an underlying confidence issue or piece, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, there's the trauma of finding love. Um, I had a crummy relationship before I had my husband mm -hmm. of I talked about pregnancy and birth. We had personally, we went through six years of infertility to have our daughter. And then we got pregnant and things were going fine, like the first half of my pregnancy. But then 
we experienced complications going into my third trimester. I got all this extra weight and amniotic fluid. My daughter went transverse. And long story short, we lost our home birth because that's what we planned to do. Mm -hmm. That's what we felt comfortable with. And instead, we ended up having to have a pre-planned cesarean for safety because yeah. our daughter was estimated before birth. She was estimated about 11 pounds. She was 12 pounds when she was born. I'm only five foot. So... <laughs> So, and my husband's six one. So do the math. It's just, it just yeah, was not so safe. that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there was trauma there. I mean, Absolutely. I'm that they caught it and that mm -hmm. they, our midwife and our specialist and our OR team were able to come together on a group front and figure out mm -hmm. and make the choice, the executive choice of like, this is the situation. Yeah. Let's not put the two of them through more trauma or an unsafe situation. And so we, we, we came through fine. We were safe. But there was that trauma. You have that trauma mm -hmm. of what you plant. And there, and that's okay. I want to say too, to that piece that trauma isn't necessarily just from the aspect of something bad happening to mm -hmm. you. There's a sense of mourning, mm -hmm. of grief. So yes. speaking from my caregiving trauma, the loss of my husband, being able to leave my, the simplest thing of being able to leave my husband alone with mm -hmm. our daughter. He can't drive anymore because he couldn't have a seizure while driving. Yeah. Uh, there's just all these different things that you have to release and let go of and come to peace with both the person who's being cared for, mm -hmm. but also the caregiver. Yeah. So there's different perspectives as well with dealing with trauma, mm -hmm. the person that's um, touched by it in different ways. Yeah. Bringing up that piece of grief, I think is so important and actually something that kind of, you know, grief came to mind as you first started talking about trauma and transition and those kinds of things. I'm like, yeah, there's a grieving process there for the shift and change in, in your life. And, you know, when you're making those changes and those kinds of things, you had mentioned that you are still on your journey. And I think we are all on our burnout recovery journey. I don't believe that it ever really ends in that aspect because it's burnout is not something that we can really avoid. We just become more resilient to it and, you know, implement our, you know, our practice of recovery. What are some things that you do for yourself now, just kind of day to day that helps support you in that recovery journey? Um, it may sound cliche, but not listening to, or listening to my body and mm -hmm. sticking to my diet. I, mm -hmm. I, I went plant-based a couple of years, three years ago when we were, when I was having, when I was having flare-ups because of my hypothyroidism mm -hmm. gut issues and it worked. I lost 30 plus pounds and we conceived our daughter. That's how we conceived our daughter and my gut health got better, but yeah. then it shifted again after I had my daughter and I went back and forth on my diet because we were raising our daughter and we had mm -hmm. those expenses with that. So I put my eating on the back burner, mm -hmm. which was a big mistake. I think, and, you know, part of it, it wasn't all of it, but that could have been part of it. So I think sticking to my diet, mm -hmm. um, just keeping a routine. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big one. Um, like I said, I get, I get up early. I get up between five and seven and work. Mm -hmm. We're in there. I get up and do some early office hours where my family's sleeping. Um, and then I work otherwise on my phone, my laptop, you know, when yeah. I can. Uh, but that is a form of self-care because it is a form of moving the needle forward and mm -hmm. letting me do something for myself. Because my work is, whole, I want it to be to where I serve others. And it's, yeah. some, it's a release and an outlet for me, but it's also meant to, I want to build money. I want to build a business. I want to um, be able to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, also I'd say music has been very therapeutic mm -hmm. of late. I am, I'm a Christian and I do l love my Christian music. And I've been listening to a lot of YouTube when I'm working. I find mm -hmm. that's really therapeutic for encouraging partly to block out the noise so I can focus, but sure. <laughs> um, I also podcasts or music have been the things I love to have going when I'm working. And I really have been listening to a lot of TBN. Mm -hmm. um, they've been doing a lot of uh, praise episodes yeah. or, or excuse me, holiday episodes. They did a couple for Thanksgiving and a couple mm -hmm. for December. And so just having those ba back, I've been listening to those a lot. Yeah. And it's just been nice to just hear affirmations from the Bible and just music and just my soul just feels filled. It just fills me and helps feed my creative soul. So that's me though. And yeah. so I would say, don't fall in the comparison trap of, oh, I have to do it like so-and-so. I have mm -hmm. to do it exactly like Melissa does it, or I have to do it exactly like Kate does it. That's not the case. The trick right. is to find bite-sized nuggets 
of ways that you can get your self-care in throughout the day. 15 minutes, whether it's hydrating, whether it's journaling, whether it's eat, getting that snack in, yeah. stretching, taking a deep breath, you know, or going outside for a walk if you have a chance, um, reading, listening to music, dancing to your favorite song. I don't care. The main thing is I want you, I want us all to just tap into that. What can we do to take care of ourselves throughout the day? Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. And specifically the reminder of like, don't like it, your journey is not the same as everyone else's journey and your recovery practices may not be the same as everyone else's recovery practices. I think you highlighted a couple of things that are key for our listeners to, to utilize, to figure out what to use for their recovery. So I think that listening to your body is so important. So figuring out like, what are your indicators in your body that you need more sleep or you need more water or whatever that is. So how do you listen to your body? I think tuning in and giving, offering time and space for yourself throughout the day. You talked about your workspace early in the morning while everyone is sleeping. So listeners figuring out what, you know, what's a time of day that you have some time that's just yours. And then fill that with things that bring you joy and comfort and peace. And I think that that spirituality connection is important for everyone. So whatever that looks like for you, make sure that you are honoring some kind of spiritual connection throughout your day. So connecting to something that is grander and bigger than yourself is an important piece to that to keep in mind. This has been so helpful. I have so enjoyed having you on the show and listeners. Of course, if you are enjoying the show, hit that subscribe button, share it with a friend, leave a review. Melissa, if you were to offer one additional piece of advice to our listeners, what would that be? Ooh, don't get your girl started. I could go all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just passionate about this stuff because it's it certainly plays a part in my life, a big part in my life. I will say that with what I've been through, what I'm still going through on a daily basis, because it's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. This is going to be a lifelong shift. And I think the less, so I think the, if I can leave you with anything is give yourself grace. You're doing the best you can. Um, keep trying, mm -hmm. figure out what works for you. And you're not a failure. Okay. This is something that I've tapped into this week that actually my business coach does. So shout out to, to Faith Mariah. So shout out to my girl. But um, one thing I'm having a breakthrough with is that, you know what, we're all on our journey for our, at our own rate and pace. And our journey is meant to be unique. God made it that way. So with that being said, we all go through different seasons, going back to that verse in Ecclesiastes, where it says, um, there's a time for every matter under heaven. So if that's the truth, then that means it's okay in this season to go at a pace that you feel in your gut is right for you. Mm -hmm. And in the next season, it's okay to go at that pace that is right for you because things do change. So with thinking about burnout, tap into the belief also too, or the realization that it will change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your burnout routine, change it up because you don't want to get burned out, obviously with the same, doing the same things. That's another piece to it, but also be flexible mm -hmm. with changing and shifting things to what's going on with your life in any given season, because there's different seasons. I'm in a different season, even being two years into my caregiving journey, mm -hmm. I'm in a different season now than I was when I had a smaller child, mm -hmm. than when I was not so organized or had a good handle on how I could balance motherhood, being a wife, being a mom, and running a business. <laughs> so every, and then dealing with my own health. So there is different seasons and it's okay to, I want to leave you with the words pivot and be flexible. Okay. I love that. Pivot yeah. and be flexible because it's going to change. It's not going to stay the same forever and definitely for sure. Yes. So keep that, that pivot and flexibility in mind and continue to assess your burnout recovery plan as it changes, as your seasons of life change. So important. Melissa, where can our listeners find out more about you? Um, the two places to find me the easiest would be either on my website or Instagram. I am predominantly on Instagram. I do have a Facebook um, business page, um, Melissa Miller, 2000. 
um, Melissa Miller to 2020 is my handle over there. And it's my Tyro Supermom blog page. That was from with my old website. I just haven't changed, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not over there a ton. So your girl's on the gram a lot. I awesome. do daily feed posts three times a day. I do two to three reels. I've been doing daily lives and I'm getting back into that because I am in a launch for a brand new drip course coming out at the end of the month. It will be live uh, or the first two modules will be live on January 31st. I'm so excited. It's called Finding Your Balance, A Realistic Approach to Motherhood and Caregiving. Mm -hmm. It's $97. And if you sign up now, you're locked in. So any updates I get, any updates I do, you will get those for free. And it's a self-paced course. So that is for you. Um, my Instagram handle is at Melissa Miller 2011. Shoot me a DM, leave a comment on any of my content over there. I'd be happy to get back with you. And then my website is Melissa Miller 2011.podia.com. You can direct message me over there. You can shoot me an email. There's all sorts of ways that you can get in touch with your girl. And I would love to talk with you if you have any questions or are struggling with motherhood awesome. or caregiving. And we'll make sure that those links are available in the show notes or they are available for in the show notes for you, dear listeners. Melissa, thank you again for coming on the show. I have so appreciated our conversation. Thank you for having me and to all your listeners, be well, be safe and just breathe and take it one day at a time. You are loved, you are valued, and you will make it through this hard season. Yes, could not agree more. All right, audience members, I want to, again, thank our guest, Melissa Miller, for coming on the show. What a great conversation, talking a little bit about transition and trauma and that grief. And with that, we're going to move into our recovery moment so we can take a little bit of a breather to Together. Remember to only practice this when it is safe to do so. And if that is not you right now, give it a listen, but come back to me later. Today, our recovery moment is focusing on tuning into our feeling tones. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those feeling tones, what's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Whenever an experience comes into your awareness, you can look at it more deeply by acknowledging its feeling tone. Feeling tones are not emotions. A feeling tone describes what you are experiencing as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. A feeling tone can be attached to anything you perceive through the senses, including a thought. By noticing the feeling tone, you continue to deepen your insight into the nature of your experience. So settle in to a comfortable sitting position. Go ahead and take a deep breath with me in through your nose and out. One more deep breath in through your nose and out. And on this next breath, allow your eyes to close focusing your sen on the sensations of your body breathing. Concentrate on your breath in through your nose and out and feel yourself dropping into a state of grounded mindfulness. Tune into your whole body. Be aware of any spots that feel tense, or tight, see if you can allow them to relax and soften. Just notice what arises in your body. Don't judge anything as good or bad. Just pay attention to the actual experience of feeling in your body. Once you are present, with your bodily sensations, expand your awareness to include feeling tones. Acknowledge the feeling in the body and consider whether the experience is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. If you like, you can scan your body and notice the feeling tone for each place in the body. Let's start with your feet. Scan your feet, notice the experience, and notice the feeling tone 
moving up your legs to your calves, your knees, your thighs, buttocks, now your torso. Concentrate on your stomach, your lower back, on up to your chest, feeling the rise and fall of your breath, noticing, noticing any bodily experience you have there. Notice the feeling tone. Is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Moving on up to your shoulders and neck, down your arms, through your biceps, through your forearms, down to your hands, to the very tip of every finger, noticing those bodily experiences and whether you experience any feeling tone. And is the tone pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Move back up your arm, back through your shoulders, up your neck, into your face, into your head. Include the sense of hearing in your practice. As a sound arrives into your awareness, note that you are hearing what you are hearing and observe the feeling tone. Continue to listen as the sounds come in, noting what they are and observing the tone. Is it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral? Now include your thoughts. You don't need to dive into exactly what you're thinking. Recognize when a thought is present and if there is a feeling tone attached. Allow the thoughts to flow, acknowledging their presence. Considering the feeling tone as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Allow the next thought or next experience to arise. This rest and open mindfulness can leave space for mental wandering. Remember that you can always return to the breath as your anchor during this practice, in through the nose and out, in through the nose and out. Continue to take a few deep breaths, settling back into your body, noticing the space you're in, your present surroundings. Take a breath in through your nose and out. In through your nose and out. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and strive to move through your day. And as you do, see if you can notice the feeling tones attached to what you see here and feel. Remember that for more recovery moments, you can follow me at Dr. Kate Steiner on Instagram and subscribe to the From Burnout to Recovery show on YouTube. I am so grateful for our guest, Melissa Miller, for joining us today. And as always, I'm grateful to each of you for listening. Thank you for joining us on the From Burnout to Recovery show with Dr. Kate on Transformation Talk Radio. I'm Dr. Kate, and I wish you peace on your journey. Thank you for joining me on the front porch today. And remember 
that you can download your free burnout to recovery reflection journal on my website at drkatesteiner.com. Be well, my friends. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Kate, on the From Burnout to Recovery show, where you are starting your journey to burnout recovery. You are invited to join me on the front porch every second and fourth Friday of the month on transformationtalkradio.com to continue growing in resilience and integrating recovery into your daily life. If you would like to learn more or find out how to work with me, visit liftwellnessconsulting.com.